uh, thank you, Alex, for a nice talk. Uh, uh, it sounds like you, the things you didn't want to address, you said Carl would take care of it, right? That's, but um, I changed the title of my talk uh, in part because um, uh, the organizers uh, came back and asked me to update it based on um, what I had written. The last time that I was in um, Brussels, I gave a talk in a club and it was for Knights, you know, that the Knights uh, program. And I thought this would be similar. And I thought, uh, so I, I, by the way, I have three books, uh, not two, three. Uh, and my last book, Drug Use for Grown Ups, uh, I basically said, let's cut this shit, okay? Let's be honest. Um, most of the people who use drugs don't have a problem. I I'll talk about that. And most of the people who use drugs are like you, middle class, well-to-do people who are in the closet. If you just got out of the closet about your drug use, we could change a lot of this. But you, we have decided to stay in the closet and continue with the nonsense. And so um, I'll play the game today. Um, I'll give a talk that kind of deals with the science and I'll do that sort of thing to, um, uh, I guess, satisfy the people's need to play the games. Um, but I'm really trying to get out of the game. Uh, I'm gonna set my timer just to make sure that I uh, speak for 30 minutes and then have time for questions. So the title of the talk is Using Drugs to Contempa Contemplate Innovative Drug Strategies. That's a joke, it's really like academic masturbation. That's what we're doing here. Uh, and so uh, I'll participate. I'll, I'll, um, in doing so, I have to tell you that um, when I wrote this latest book, um, I kind of went on a journey, uh, an intellectual, uh, uh, actual uh, journal journey going around the world, uh, just trying to see what people are doing in terms of their drug use. And as I think about my journey, I think about what the writer James Baldwin has said about journeys. Um, you cannot know what you'll discover on the journey, what you will do, what, what, you, what you find, or what you find will do to you. And what I found really changed me. I've been studying drugs for now more than 30 years, uh, publishing in the scientific literature, more than 100 publications, um, and things really hasn't changed that much. We still play these games. Um, and so uh, I'm trying my damnedest to be a grown up and be an adult about this and be honest about what we do as humans. Uh, but the public, uh, it's really invested in these games. And so it's difficult for me to be an adult in a society or where people insist upon us behaving like children. Um, so uh, today what I'd like to do is just share with you a few of the lessons that I've learned, uh, largely focused on uh, the bad assumptions that we have about drugs and the people who use drugs. And these bad assumptions uh, keep us playing these games. Um, one of the first lessons that I've learned is that drug effects are predominantly positive. Uh, people who take drugs do so because drugs work. Uh, uh, full disclosure, I should tell you that I'm on drugs now. I'm on caffeine, I'm on amphetamine. Um, the, those drugs help me be alert as I talk to you. Those drugs make me happy to talk to you. Otherwise, I might not be so happy uh, being forced to act like a child. Uh, but I'm happy to be here to talk to you. Um, so the predominant effects of drugs are positive. We've shown this in the laboratory where we've given these drugs thousands of doses to people uh, over the 30 year period or so that I've been studying drugs. Um, some of you all know this now uh, with some of the drugs that people talk about in public, the psychedelics. One of the things that we've done with the psychedelics 
in recent years is that we've tried to rehabilitate the reputation, the reputation of psychedelics in large part because of the people who psychedelic drugs are associated with. Middle class, uh, well-to-do white people, largely some of the writers, um, they're really into these drugs, drugs like psilocybin, um, LSD, uh, ayahuasca. Uh, uh, and, and so the reputation of uh, psychedelics are, are being uh, rehabilitated. But one of the things that I want to make clear for us here today, what is termed a psychedelic really depends on who's doing the classification. So when we think about a drug like these drugs I have on the slide, PCP and ketamine, ketamine is considered a psychedelic, uh, but ketamine is made actually by altering the PCP structure. PCP is not really thought of as being a psychedelic in part because of the negative association it has uh, based largely on narrative created by law enforcement in the US. But essentially, the, dr the drugs produce a number of the same effects. PCP lasts longer than ketamine, and, but ketamine is FDA approved in the United States to treat something like depression. Uh, drugs produce similar effects, wildly different narratives surrounding the drugs, in part, in large part, because it depends on who is thought to be the users. MDMA versus methamphetamine. MDMA is considered a psychedelic, uh, um, whereas methamphetamine is not. Um, MDMA's chemical name is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. Uh, it has a methylene ring, and, and that's the only difference. Uh, they produce similar and overlapping, effect, uh, well, overlapping effects, and also, as well as divergent effects. We've tested both of these drugs in the laboratory in people who are under double blind conditions. And, and so that's in the literature, but the narratives surrounding these drugs wildly differ uh, in large part because who's thought to be the user. So that's an important aspect that we should think about when we, we're, we're talking about these drugs. Our classifications um, sometimes are, are arbitrary and it really depends on who's doing the classification. Classify. When it comes to drug effects, the most important things about, uh, about the drugs themselves is dose. Um, you want to make sure that people understand the dose that they're taking. As we increase the dose, we increase the likelihood of nonspecific effects, and we worry that some of those nonspecific effects are ne can be negative. Routes of administration is important. Uh, taking a drug orally versus taking it intravenously. Alter, alters the time course of effects, and that also can alter how uh, potent or powerful the effects are. So those things are important to consider when we're talking about drugs. So if you're talking about drug or drug effects and not talking about dose and not talking about route of administration, then you've already have engaged in a conversation of ignorance. This is an exchange of ignorance. So you have to talk about dose. You have to talk about route of administration, you have to talk about the user's sort of top level of tolerance, where drug use occurs. All of these things are, are critically important for influencing drug effects. If you're not talking about these factors, then you're engaged in an exchange of ignorance. And we don't need any more exchanges of ignorance when it comes to drugs. Uh, other lessons that I've learned, I wanna just point out that I don't wanna minimize <laughs> any potential negative effects associated with drugs because there are potential negative effects associated with drugs, just like there are with any activity that you do that's worth doing. Um, and so I wanna just say a word about overdoses in the United States because that has uh, gained a lot of international attention. Um, when we think about overdoses in the United States, the drug that people, or the class of drug that people primarily talk about are the opioids. Um, uh, and, and so when we think about 
who, how people are dying or what drugs people have in their system when they die. In the United States, in the blue here, the, the, this, this larger one where 50 some thousand individuals had a, a fentanyl analog or fentanyl or, uh, in their system when they died, uh, that's, the, that's the major sort of concern in the United States at the moment. But I have to say, when it comes to measuring drug overdoses in the United States, um, it, we always present this big number, but people, it is really important for us to understand that our data collection is riddled with limitations, beginning with the people who actually do the death investigations. Uh, death investigations of like drug overdoses are primarily conducted in the United States by two groups of people. Medical examiners, these individuals uh, have a medical degree and they have some training in forensic pathology. And then the other group are coroners. The only educational requirement for a coroner in the United States, for uh, most of the coroners in the United States, is a high school diploma. Uh, and so, and they are doing the vast majority of our death investigations in the United States. And we have no national standards. And so when, when they complete their um, death certificate, it goes to our Center for Disease Control. And about a third of those death certificates are incomplete, inaccurate. Um, and, and so uh, that system is less than perfect. On top of that, when you think about, there are a number of jurisdictions who don't even measure for most drugs. And, and, they, and many of them don't measure for drugs in terms of what's in a person's body. They don't measure for certain drugs on a consistent basis. And so we have a lot of variability in terms of uh, what is happening in each jurisdiction. Uh, and so these numbers that people Howed out uh, are um, uh, uh, I, they 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 don't inspire confidence in people who care about numbers or in people who are trying to figure out what's going on because we don't know what's going on. All we know is that a person has died and they may have a they have a drug in their system. We don't know if that drug caused the death, and this is critically important because most of the drug related the uh, fatalities or things that we call drug-related fatalities involve multiple drugs. And so we want to know well, which drug caused the problem? Which drug rose to the level of toxicity? Or was there an interaction um, uh, that caused this sort of problem? I, I, I don't know. And I don't think anyone knows because we're not really um, doing that kind of work in the United States, to be honest. And so we think about uh, newer uh, and potentially more potent um, novel psychoactive substances. We know very little about that in the United States. Uh, alcohol is often ignored uh, when we have these drug-related fatalities. Um, uh, medications that are prescribed like for pain, for uh, nerve pain, uh, things like uh, gabapentin, ignored. Uh, antihistamines, which uh, some of the older ones, they produce um, uh, quite um, uh, extensive uh, sedation, things like promethazine, uh, ignored. Uh, uh, also ignored acetaminophen or uh, uh, um, uh, acetaminophen is called uh, paracetamol uh, in this part of the world, ignored. Uh, we know that drug is the number one reason for liver toxicity in the world, oftentimes ignored. And we also know that many of the opioid formulations in the United States contain a large dose of paracetamol and just a small dose of opioid. And yet we are not even really paying attention to the uh, paracetamol. Um, and so I wrote about some of these issues in a popular journal uh, or a magazine called Scientific uh, American and tried to um, uh, get people to think about these things a little more uh, deeply. Um, 
other issues uh, uh, that uh, are potentially negative. Of course, people worry about uh, addiction, and so do I. Now, when I talk about addiction, I want to make sure that you all understand what I'm talking about. When I talk about addiction, I'm talking about these symptoms that are listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. They also correspond to um, the international classification uh, symptoms and people have to endorse a certain number of symptoms um, a, 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 as well as uh, the person has to be distressed or impaired by those symptoms. So you have these two requirements before you can say someone is addicted. And so when I talk about addiction, th th this is what I mean, this thing called substance use, substance use disorder. Uh, it's just so we're all on the same page. Um, the point, my main point, is that most people who take drugs don't have a problem. They don't meet criteria for drug addiction. Most of the people who take, this is a, uh, 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 this statistic or this fact uh, sometimes get lost in our conversations about drugs because we have this disproportionate focus on uh, drug addiction uh, in part because the people who work in this field are trying to save people uh, even if they don't want to be saved and uh, I get it. Uh, but, but I just want to make sure that we understand that most people don't meet criteria for uh, addiction. Most of the people who use drugs, uh, they go to work, they take care of their families, they pay their taxes, uh, they support bad policies that their governments uh, put out. Um, sometimes they even become president of the United States. Um, uh, all three of these guys, Barack Obama, George Bush, Bill Clinton, all three of these guys acknowledge using drugs uh, as uh, adults. Um, and uh, this is not to besmirch their reputation because, you know, they did uh, what they could do for their, we can argue about their policies, I get that, but they did uh, serve their country at the highest level. Uh, the current two guys, uh, uh, they, uh, both of them say they don't, they have never used drugs. Uh, and Donald Trump, well, what can, uh, do I need to say anymore? I don't think so. Uh, and, and Joe Biden, uh, Poor Joe. Um, <laughs> both of these guys don't they, they, they ha, say they haven't used drugs. Uh, perhaps maybe they should have. Uh, uh, well, the point, the point is this. The point is this. If the majority of people who use any particular drug do not become addicted, then we cannot blame the drug for causing drug addiction. It would be like blaming food for food addiction. Or it would be like blaming, I don't know, uh, football for, uh, uh, for gambling. Uh, it's ridiculous, but this is what we do with drugs. Uh, and so when it comes to drugs, if you really wanna solve the problem, drugs are not the problem for, as, when it comes to addiction. When it comes to addiction, we know what the problems are. They are predictable factors. Um, but in order to get at these predictable, effect, these predictable factors, you have to do a comprehensive access, assessment, which takes some time, and it has to be complete, completed by a, a, a competent uh, clinician. Uh, and when you do this, you find that uh, the people who meet criteria for substance use disorder or addiction also have um, uh, uh, co-occurring psychiatric problems, uh, other problems like physical illnesses, uh, poverty, whether it's intellectual, where it, whether it's uh, uh, economic. Um, the, uh, many of these folks are subjected to chronic, unrealistic expectations, uh, among other reasons that uh, people may um, have uh, for meeting uh, criteria for a substance use disorder. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, the field is ha it has been focused on is this notion of uh, 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 drug addiction is it causes a brain disease or is caused by a brain disease. That's sort of a, this is a dominant theory in the field, a dominant theory with no data in human uh, humans uh, and uh, this theory was kind of first well, really uh, well articulated um, back in the, uh, 97 by Alan Lesnar. He was, the, at the time, he was the 
director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the U.S., and he said that that addiction is tied to changes in brain structures and function is what makes it fundamentally a brain disease. Uh, Allen wrote this uh, per persuasive editorial um, that was published in the journal Science, and the field has kind of followed and uh, even though Allen didn't have any data to support that position, didn't matter. It, ha it was a great story, and the field kind of followed. Uh, the field followed so much so that the uh, current DSM-5 um, has this written in it. It says that an important characteristic of substance use disorder is an underlying change in brain circuits that may persist beyond detoxification, particularly in individuals with severe disorder. So whenever you see like a change in brain structure, function, uh, what have you, you, that means that you have to have measured what was there before drug use had commenced. Um, and this is an impossible thing to do. Uh, unless uh, our societies decide that we're going to give everyone at birth uh, and continue throughout their education uh, brain scans. And then we, 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 we see if there's some difference after the person uses drugs. We haven't done that, but this language is in the DSM. Uh, this is a, a, a glaring um, 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 uh, overstep. Uh, and, and so I, I, I want to bring this to people's attention just to show the kind of nonsense that we promote without any data and we call ourselves a science. Um, and that's not science. Um, so, and there was another thing that, that we like to do in the field too. We like to compare um, drug addiction as a brain disease with other brain diseases like Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease. With Huntington's and Parkinson's, the, these diseases are, are progressive, irreversible disorders which are ultimately fatal. Uh, and you can see some um, striatal uh, or atrophy that progresses steadily throughout the cl clinical manifestation of the disorder. Now, when you compare that to something like drug addiction or substance use disorder, most of the people will recover spontaneously. I mean, some people uh, uh, recover with treatment, some people have treatment, so I don't want to downplay that, but the point is most recover spontaneously and you don't see any neural correlates um, uh, um, with drug addiction. Uh, I know people say they see these neural correlates, but when you look at the actual data as we have done in this publication, um, you can't find these neural correlates that people uh, claim to see. Um, and so I really invite you all to read this paper uh, and also just read the literature for yourself and see if you see these neural correlates that people uh, sometimes uh, overstep and claim that they, they see. A related bad assumption is that um, drugs like crack cocaine or heroin are so powerfully addicted that they hijack a person's ability to exercise control. So we as a society have said that we want to protect you from yourself. We want to make sure we know the, what's best for you, and so we want to protect you from yourself because these drugs are so powerfully addictive. Uh, that's the definition, by the way, of paternalism. But many people think paternalism is okay when it comes to drugs. Now, uh, the problem with even that logic is that it doesn't stand up when it comes to these kind of drugs uh, for the majority of people who use these drugs. Now, um, uh, just, just some quick data. Uh, back uh, about 20 years ago, we brought some people into the lab who, meet, who met criteria for crack use disorder. And we were uh, trying to see whether or not uh, these folks would um, uh, only uh, be sensitive to the drug itself. So we gave them an opportunity to self-administer, uh, select uh, doses of crack cocaine versus small amounts of money in this case versus five dollars. Um, and so the prediction was that if these drugs were so powerfully addiction, addictive, uh, these people who were crack addicts would have taken crack on every opportunity. Uh, what you see here is that they took money on about half of the occasions and drug on about 
the other half of the occasion. When you increase the money to something like $20, uh, as we did in this study with methamphetamine, you see that they almost never take drug and they take money on the vast majority of the occasions. Just, it just says that uh, um, uh, people's behavior uh, or drug taking behavior is governed by the same principles um, as other behaviors. And that drug, drug people, drug people, people who use drugs can and do uh, behave uh, in, ra in rational ways, at least as rational as everyone else. Uh, and so this notion of protecting people from themselves uh, really needs to be uh, reevaluated. It needs to be reevaluated in the context of other things that we do in our society too uh, that are potentially harmful. Um, uh, on the slide here, I just have European football and I have uh, UCF, uh, this boxing mixed martial arts sport. Now both of these sports, um, uh, with, with soccer, as we call it in the U.S., you all call it football here. With, with, with soccer, for example, soccer players uh, are more likely to die from neurodegenerative neural diseases, uh, at least three times more so than people in the general population, uh, because heading the ball, uh, hitting the ball with your head is, is not, not good for your head. But the, these guys who play this sport, they know this, they know the risks that are involved and they have made the risk to benefit calculations and they still choose to play that sport. And that's fine, that's their decision because many of these guys will experience far more glory than any of us in our life. And so they, they take that, 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 that's a ratio that they think is favorable. Uh, the same is true with uh, this mixed, mar mixed uh, martial arts fighting. Uh, this one here I find really interesting because if you listen to any of the guys who participate in this sport, many of these guys are cognitively impaired before they get out of their 20s. Uh, but they know the risks that are involved. And so the question becomes, should you protect them from themselves in, in, when they want to engage in this activity again? they will experience uh, probably more glory in their life doing this than they would otherwise. I mean, because let's be honest, the people who are engaged in these sports are people who are on the margins of our society and they've been shut out. Uh, and so this is a way to participate or a way to um, have money, some love, take care of their family, and so forth. And then, of course, we have American football. <laughs> American football, the, the same sort of thing occurs. Boxing, all of these sports, uh, far, more, far more dangerous, in my mind, than, drug, than taking drugs. But our societies have sanctioned those activities. Um, uh, uh, and so that's, those are just things that we should think about. Um, uh, and I'm going to try and wrap up here because uh, I think um, yeah, I got about five minutes. So um, finally, uh, drugs are scapegoated so authorities can avoid dealing with problems that uh, poor people face. You know, it's so much easier to say uh, uh, that you're going to hire more police and put them on the streets and take drugs off of your streets. I mean, I think you guys recently had some big cocaine bus here or something like that, right? You guys, uh, and that's, it's really easy to do that. A lot more easy to do, deal with that than to make sure that people have uh, decent jobs or decent paying jobs, make sure that people are included in your society that's a lot more complicated. And so um, drugs are ideal for politicians to use as this kind of scapegoat. And they're also ideal to use um, to target people that you don't like in your society, uh, but you can't explicitly say you don't like those people. So when you look in your society and you see who's going to jail for drugs, it will be the people who you don't like in your society. And so we need drugs or bad drug policies for that reason, for those reasons. Um, and, and so if we want to be honest about it, that's why we have bad drug policy. And there's another reason I'll get to in a second. But I just want to say something about the scapegoating of, of, of people uh, using drugs as scapegoats. Um, uh, a few years ago, I had a, a woman come in the lab. She was from Australia, and in Australia, 
they thought methamphetamine was their biggest problem, and so she wanted to investigate methamphetamine violence in methamphetamine. Anyway, she recently published a, a review of the literature seeking, looking for this aggression and violence in humans caused by methamphetamine. She didn't find it. I know she didn't find it. I've, I've given thousands of doses of methamphetamine in the lab and studied it. Uh, but anyway, she published this uh, recently, and so maybe that'll put that to bed, uh, that 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 myth to bed in Australia. I don't know because um, former uh, Philippine President uh, uh, Duterte um, certainly uh, illustrates someone who has used this drug to vilify people. In fact, Duterte said that use of this drug at the year shrinks the person's brain and so therefore they were not viable for rehabilitation. They're not valuable for, uh, viable for rehabilitation, then we can kill them. And uh, in the Philippines, uh, they certainly have uh, killed thousands of people who were suspected of dealing drugs, using drugs, and methamphetamine is the primary drug that uh, they find uh, most abhorrent in, in the Philippines. Now, there's another reason that uh, um, uh, these drugs are banned. Uh, uh, these drugs in the United States historically are banned because of our racism, our classism, and not because of pharmacology. Uh, this story, it, to me, uh, is old. I ri I've written about it. Um, and so it, it, um, if you're here, you probably you know this story. Uh, this is just a New York Times article from 1914, uh, around the time when we passed our first national drug laws restricting opioids and cocaine. Uh, and this physician um, uh, published this long editorial uh, entitled Negro Cocaine Fiends Are New Southern Menace. In this piece, he argued that black people were, uh, who took cocaine were uh, um, uh, unaffected by 32 caliber bullets um, and that they became more murderous when they took cocaine. Uh, Southern police forces increased the caliber of their weapon. They needed bigger guns to go after these mythical cocaine fiends and and the rest is history. This has been the pattern in terms of how we um, uh, think about drug policies in the United States. Um, but there's another important reason why uh, certain drugs are banned. Uh, certain drugs are banned because of this, they allow this access to this continuous stream of money. Uh, in the United States, um, we now spend more than $40 billion a year uh, focus directly on our drug control. That number has gone up since the 80s where it was like $1 billion per year. Now it's more than $40, $40 billion per year. And, okay, uh, I'll, be, I'll finish it up here in uh, one minute. Um, uh, even though we've increased this sort of funding stream, um, drug use continues. It's not going anywhere. Uh, the thing that has changed is that we are, we are arresting more people. And as long as we are arresting poor people, people uh, who are of color, people who we don't like, uh, this will continue. It's important to understand that there are a lot of people benefiting from our war on drugs. I am a beneficiary of our war on drugs. Um, back in the 1990s, we set aside money for people to study drugs, um, um, who, who were, who were uh, pursuing PhDs and studying drugs in the brain. Uh, my, my research was paid for with that pool of money, and so I recognize that um, I am a beneficiary of it. I got multi-million dollar grants as a result of this war on drugs, and a number of people are benefiting. We know the cops are benefiting. That's easy. Um, our media benefits from this sort of thing. Uh, we've uncovered sort of um, stories where uh, the media were allowing the government to rewrite scripts for television programs to increase this sort of just say no or drugs are bad message. Uh, and then they got paid a lot of money for that sort of thing. Um, so a number of people benefit. Um, that's an important reason why we continue uh, our war on drugs because if a behavior is seen repeatedly, then that behavior is serving some function. And our war on drugs 
certainly is serving the function, and it works for a number of people. That's why it continues. That's the main reason. Okay, I'll finish up. What can we do? Uh, well, we can stop overemphasizing the negative uh, drug-related negative harms. We can stop overemphasizing that, try to have some more balance to uh, reflect the reality of the situation. But more, more importantly, what we can do is we can regulate the sale and use of sought-after drugs. Um, now, um, this, uh, when I say that, I don't mean that there will be some free-for-all, um, and I hope you all know that. I, that uh, sometimes I have to engage in conversation with people who start there. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I hate starting in stupid places. Uh, and so uh, what I mean is just like we regulate anything else in our society, make sure people have uh, maybe meet a requ requirement before they can actually purchase uh, uh, this substance and make sure that the, whatever the substance are that you have that are available, that you don't have them in concentrations that are so potent that they kill people. Uh, and so it, this, this, is not, this is not complicated. Um, uh, if we do this sort of thing, of course, we will decrease uh, drug-related overdose fatalities because many of those fatalities occur because people uh, don't know what's in their substance. They don't know the dose that's in their substance. So we can uh, diminish or decrease some of the ignorance surrounding drug taking. And of course, it will create a number of jobs, millions of jobs, as we see with our cannabis legalization in the United States. And it can begin to reconcile our un inglorious past uh, practices with the, uh, uh, with the ideals that grant adults domain over their bodies as we promise in many of our constitutions where we say that you have liberty uh, to live your life as you choose so long as you don't uh, interfere with other people's ability to do the same. This is what many democratic nations say. But when it comes to drugs, somehow uh, that becomes an exception. And I, and I don't understand why uh, that's an exception, and I don't know, understand why we accept that exception. Now, I, I, I know uh, many nations are nowhere near uh, legally regulating drugs, and so I have some intermediary steps. Uh, Alex talked about decriminalization. You know what that is based on what he said. Uh, and I'll just add that we should make sure that all nations have drug checking. If you're not going to legally regulate the substances, the first thing you have to do is implement drug checking. I mean, real drug, drug checking, like they do at Ener Energy Control and other places where you get a complete printout of what is in your substance. Uh, and then we have to have more realistic uh, drug education uh, and not, again, overemphasizing uh, drug-related harms. And with that, I will open it up for questions and I will thank you for your time and attention. Maybe you can take a little bit of time to explain what, what is realistic drug education, because I, I can hear that yeah. you're talking about the harm, the real yep. harm uh, of drugs, but can you yeah. explain it a little bit more? Yeah, thank you. And so the question is, uh, what is, what do I think about really realistic drug education? Okay, let's just, let's take a drug. Let's take an opioid, for example. Um, let's take heroin. Uh, when we think about educating people about heroin, um, uh, I, I never hear anybody talk about constipation. Constipation is a really important sort of human um, uh, ailment, and it also will impact your health negatively. Uh, and so you want to make sure people have st uh, um, strategies for dealing with uh, opioid-related constipation. And then you, want, and you also want to let them know that uh, if you're experiencing constipation, particularly severe, that might say something about you overdoing it, or and so it might be a first clue. Um, and so you you help them to understand strategies to deal with uh, constipation and make sure that they don't get constipated. Uh, high fiber diets, ac exercise, um, avoid things like white bread, all of those kind of things you want to help people to understand. I mean. Um, just basic things to keep people healthy, things that are realistic. Um, and we've been pretty good at uh, saying, okay, use clean needles. 
Uh, yeah, but there are other things that are unique to the individual drugs. If we think about amphetamines, you're using uh, amphetamines on a regular basis chronically. You want to make sure you attend to your sleep. You want to make sure you're attending to your diet uh, because amphetamines, of course, disrupt can disrupt sleep and disrupt food intake. All of those things uh, we need to talk about. Uh, and then if we think about... Uh, um, combinations of drugs, uh, amphetamine, caffeine, those things, they're really good at stimulating um, um, uh, the gut. So uh, if you are constipated, um, you might want to think about amphetamines or caffeine in some cases. Uh, and so uh, all of these things we never share with people in the public about uh, what people who use drugs, uh, what, what they're doing to deal with these strategies, at least the smart ones who are really thinking about this. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, when you're talking about a realistic drug education, uh, from what age do you think people could receive that kind of education? So I'm a college professor, university professor. So I'm talking about uh, uh, my edu education. Uh, that I'm talking about really is with adults, but certainly we can uh, teach uh, people who work with young people. Uh, for example, in the United States, the, the three drugs that young people are most likely to take, alcohol, tobacco, and nicotine, and that's where most of the drug education should focus. Uh, but that's not as sexy as talking about other things, and so people waste their time oftentimes talking about these other things with, with, with younger people. So you have to make sure your education is your, the focus of your education is informed by the data. Bonjour, désolé, euh, je parle français et je parle comme anglais. Euh, quelle, est, quelle est votre analyse par rapport au, au fentanyl uh, I'm going to ask you to repeat that because I didn't have on my views on the. Okay, okay. Oh, well, uh, uh, my, my views on fentanyl. Um, so, fentanyl is, in the United States, fentanyl is uh, an FDA, Food and Drug Administration approved medication. So, it's approved to treat moderate to severe pain. And so, my views on fentanyl is like my views on on anything, any of these drugs, uh, it can be a useful tool, but if people don't understand issues of potency, dose, and that sort of thing, it can become potentially dangerous. And so, um, so uh, my views on fentanyl is that I'm really glad that it's, it's on the market, that people uh, who are in severe pain have access to it. Um, um, and then uh, in terms of the illicit sort of fentanyl supply, um, if, we wouldn't, if we didn't put so much law enforcement pressure on the opioid of choice, heroin, uh, we might not have so much fentanyl in the illicit market in the United States. Um, and so um, I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Carl. I hope you didn't suffer too much by playing the game. It didn't show, really. Amphetamines. <laughs> um, as Pascal said at the beginning, it's extremely sad that we do not have any politicians in this room. No bourgmest, no mayors, no ministers. Is there at least some political staff in the room? Maybe not. That's the place they should be, or maybe one or two or three. That's not enough. But don't worry, it happens elsewhere as well. It happens in Canada, it happens in the United States, it happens in France, in everywhere. Um, just for your information, this morning our Canadian minister uh, came out with uh, her intention, health minister, came out with her intention to come up with a uh, safe drug, uh, um, um, how do you say that? It's um, Supply? Safe supply. So we're coming up with that. Decriminalization is also on our schedule. We have a depenalization, or uh, as we say in French in Canada, déjudiciarisation bill, actually discussing at the uh, 
high chamber in Canada. So we're moving on. Uh, Carl, I have a very simple question for you. If you were not playing the game, what we would have heard this morning from you? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I turned 56 this year and I've been doing this for like 30 years and I'm really tired of starting over with the same conversation. Um, the con this is really simple. Um, uh, for me, uh, uh, as an adult, uh, you, adults should just have the right to um, alter their consciousness as they see fit. And our job in health is to make sure that uh, the product that's available uh, has some quality control. Um, and uh, our job is to enhance the safety of the product as possible, just like we do with, with driving uh, automobiles and a number of other activities in our society. And uh, I really just want to encourage people to, to get out of the closet. Uh, if middle class people get out of the closet and state that they use these substances, which I know they do because I get high with many of you, um, I know they do, we would change this. Because as long as the activity is seen as an activity engaged in primarily by people who are undesired in your societies, politicians have no real reason to change because the, po the population too remain ignorant about this. Um, I am not so um, uh, disappointed that politicians are not in the house. I, I, I find them to be a waste of time. Um, the best use of my time is educating the general public about this because the politicians typically go where the votes go. And so if you educate the general public, the politicians will follow. The politicians almost never lead. Uh, and so our conversations with politicians, again, just become another exercise in academic masturbation. I would like to ask a question myself. Sure. Um, what about the situation now, about what we know about positive use of drugs? What's the situation of the research on that? And what could we potentially learn from it? Uh, what we've learned from the potential positive effects of drugs? Like, uh, can, can you say it again? I'm well, sorry. I think there is maybe a lack of research on that. Oh, awesome. and, and gotcha. Or is it changing? And what's, what's what we know from that side of scientific I studies? I see. Uh, no, there is not a lack of research. Uh, uh, you look in the scientific literature, uh, there are a plethora of data scientific papers where, uh, I mean, our group alone has published uh, decades of, of, of papers looking at the effects of, of heroin in humans, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, uh, ketamine, a wide range of drugs in humans. And uh, one of the things that you have to do is you actually have to look at the data because the narrative that are presented uh, oftentimes downplay any positive effects associated with the drugs, largely based on the fact that most of these studies are funded by the U.S.'s National Institute on Drug Abuse. And their mission had been for many years, it only recently changed, uh, it had been that um, um, their focus would be on the negative aspects of drug, uh, drug taking, the pathology. Um, but recently we forced their mission to, to become more broad. Um, but if you look at the literature, uh, what's said uh, differs oftentimes from what, it, what the actual data shows. And so if people actually go in and look at the literature, um, the story, the data is all there. I, I understand that many people won't want to read the scientific literature. Uh, it probably shouldn't even be called literature because it's so poorly written, but uh, it is, uh, it's there for the public. Um, yeah, I would like to have your, your input in some com comparison thing that I'm making to myself since the beginning of this week. And it might, be not, might not be your primary field, but I'm really interested in how you see it because of your knowledge of, of drugs in society. 
Um, I've been attending this week conference in fancy places with very interesting academic, and, 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 and we are here in a very fancy places too. Yet, Belgium is not close from decriminalizing drugs, I think. A few months ago, uh, Belgium was the second country in the world to decriminalize sex work. And the sex worker organization never had fancy uh, conferences like this. And we have had this coverage and this public display of interest of institution, but yet it's decriminalized. So I'm, I'm really, what's going on? Why, <laughs> you know? I would like to have your, your opinion on that. Uh oh, that's a tough one, but that's a great question. I think that's the question that should be asked. Um, uh, maybe the people who are uh, in these kind of conference, um, uh, maybe their uh, sincerity for changing drug laws is not as great as they, they state it is. Uh, maybe that's what's going on, or maybe they are just not as effective. Or maybe they uh, like to play these games like we're playing, uh, and so things don't change. Um, um, I, 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 to be honest, I, I, don't, I, I don't think these things are, are the most effective ways to change things. I mean, it, this, I don't think we need a big conference like this. Uh, I think uh, it's very basic and very simple to me. Um, I think about um, how we dealt with homosexuality in our society forever, where we marginalized people who had sex with other people of the same sex for so many years. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, things kind of changed. Um, but those people themselves, they didn't change. Their humanity didn't change. Their humanity remained the same. Uh, the same is true with people who take drugs. We act sometimes as if their humanity is somehow different in this day and age, and uh, we don't treat their humanity like other people's humanity. And once we start doing that, then it becomes really simple. Um, uh, it, it, who should say? whether or not you're going to alter your consciousness in the privacy of your own home. Uh, who, who should have that, that right to say that you can't? Um, that impacts your liberty, your freedom. Um, and, and when we start thinking about it like that, I think that we will, uh, well, I hope we will have, uh, things will change more quickly. Um, but it's, it's as basic as that. If we, we have to just keep this thing really simple and really basic and stop playing these games. Okay, I think I'm being called off the stage. They're playing the music for me to get off the stage. Okay, thank you very much. Uh,